I think the, the labor movement needs different kinds of leadership now. And this election felt really significant to me that we would be the first all women leadership team in the Vermont State Labor Council's history. Vermont AFL-CIO a few years ago went through a contested election, which was, I don't know if it was the uh, first for Vermont, but it is certainly uh, unconventional in labor federations. Most of the time, uh, these decisions are made, um, you know, in in back rooms and, and backdoor politicking, basically, uh, and, and the uh, races are uncontested uh, publicly. Um, and, and so that didn't happen in Vermont. In Vermont, there was a contested election, and the left-wing reform slate uh, won. And the they ha- won a second term, and now they're on their third term, I believe. Uh, this time, the slate is different, now led by three women. Uh, the uh, former president uh, stepped aside to, um, you know, after two terms to let uh, other folks uh, take the reins. And so, uh, really exciting the stuff that they're doing. They're strengthening their ties with Vermont's Progressive Party. Um, they're also uh, investing in organizing and supporting affiliates. They have gotten the Vermont uh, State Employees Association, which had long not been affiliated with AFL-CIO, to affiliate uh, after their uh, consecutive wins with the uh, more reform, organizing-minded slate. Uh, so we have had David Van Dusen on the program before, but not to talk about the AFL-CIO, uh, the, his, his success in Vermont, uh, but rather we had him on to talk about... Um, Rojava, right? Rojava solidarity work that he was doing. Um, so I think this is going to be the first time that we have, we've we've dug deep into what's been going on in Vermont, which is kind of bonkers now that I <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, but nevertheless, we're really excited to have uh, Liz Medina, executive director of the uh, Vermont AFL CIO, and Ellen K. Is that yes, vice Ellen president. K, vice president, executive vice president for the Vermont AFL CIO. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us and huge fan of your show. So what an honor. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to have y'all. And I guess the first thing to that, that, that I want to uh, I, I want to hear from y'all and, and, and we'll start with Ellen. Uh, can you talk to us about the the, the, the history of y'all's, you know, kind of uh, 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 takeover of the Vermont AFL-CIO. Did I, did I get it basically right and talk to us about the uh, the, the reasoning that, y- that y'all felt like it was necessary to have uh, uh, a different approach to leading the state's labor federation? Um, so I know you invited me to speak first, but I think it would be much more appropriate if Liz speaks first because I'm a relative newcomer. Um, this is my first term, and Liz has been a lot around for a lot of this, so I think I would like to defer to Liz for this part. Perfect. Sure. Uh, happy to do so. And full disclosure, I was part of the original United Slate that ran in 2019. I was a rank and file union member at Goddard College with local UAW 2322. I had been involved in the Labor Council before 2019 and 2016, and I really believed in the idea of a federation and the importance of workers having a regular uh, opportunity to connect with each other and support each other. You know, as Mother Jones said, our masters are joined together and we must do the same thing. And I believed that this institution could be that, but it really was not an active institution at the time and really didn't have a vision of how it would be come revitalized again. Hmm. And David Van Dusen approached me in 2019 and we met at a bar and we had a big discussion about the labor movement. And he started to talk to me about the 10 point program that he and a few others had put together. And it was exactly pretty much the vision I thought was necessary in the program that was needed in order to build a thriving labor movement and a thriving federation again. It mainly centered on prioritizing organizing versus trying to do the same old endorsement of the Democratic Party and trying to play electoral politics and lobbying. These games are, you know, benefit uh, or, or advantage people with lots of money <laughs> more than 
working people. So I was really excited and I saw um, who else was uh, coming on to the slate and uh, knew them to be uh, fantastic leaders. Um, the executive vice president was Tristan Aidy, and she had just recently led a uh, the nurses' strike at the University of Vermont Medical Center in 2018, and uh, you know gave fiery speeches. Great organizer, and so I was really excited about this. And in 2019, um, you know, prior <laughs> to other uh, conventions of the State Labor Council, this one was contested. Um, so instead of you know 20 people showing up to go through the motions, there was at least 100 plus people there. A lot of excitement, a lot of debate about mm. what we should be doing in this moment to strengthen the working class and labor movement. And I think that you know a contested election is really healthy because it gives space for that kind of debate. And so uh, that vision did carry the day in 2019, and it continued to do so because. Uh, I think um, the program is showing some success and people believe that this is the direction we need to go. I think the rank and file really want to be engaged, want to organize, are tired of the same old methods that aren't working anymore. What was and the program? Yeah, what was the program that y'all won on in, in, in 2019? And and you said that, you know, y'all have seen some success. Can you talk to us about, about that success? Yeah, so um, the, the program, is uh, you can find it on our website, vt.aflcio.org, and it's called the 10-Point Program, and it includes a number of general policies that we follow, uh, you know, prioritizing organizing, like I said, but also not being afraid of strikes, um, being militant, um, building, you know, uh, a diverse working class solidarity. Uh, there's uh, uh, anti-fascist statements in there as well. Um, the, there's a, a, a call for political independence um, and looking at supporting um, parties outside the two-party system. Uh, there's um, building a popular front, um, being in line with other allied organizations, environmental groups, um, BIPOC groups, um, knowing that we are, our struggles are all connected. Um, and I would say some of the successes that came out of that are some of the organizing programs and also educational programs that were developed out of that uh, vision. Um, so namely, I would say we have this uh, really exciting program called Worker Circles. Um, basically, it's a peer support group for union and non-union workers. As long as you don't have hiring, firing power, workers, all workers are welcome. And if you want to come learn how to form a union or rebuild your union and want the brilliance of other workers in the room, um, helping you guide uh, you through that and also build collective power and relationships at the same time, um, it's a space for that. And we hold these uh, spaces on a regular basis. We have ones in Burlington, Montpelier, and now in Brattleboro. And they're inspired by Ellen David Freeman's Community Union Organizers, uh, which she wrote about on Labor Notes a few years ago. And we just uh, took it and uh, developed it into a whole program and organizing campaigns have come out of that. Um, we also have on-call organizers. So, you know, we are uh, a scrappy little labor council. We don't have a huge budget, but we um, can hire uh, organizers on an ad hoc basis to help out our affiliate unions um, with whatever campaigns they have going on. And we also just this past summer started a salting program, or um, as some call it, inside organizing. I think that the and that inside organizing program, um, the there's been a lot of success around that, and and that was actually kind of central to the Starbucks campaign. Uh, so all of that is extremely exciting to me as a, a labor council officer. You know, I, I think that, that Vermont's labor federation, because Vermont's a small state, um, is it's larger than than the labor council that we have. Uh, that we could potentially have here. I mean, we're very small, uh, but if all of the unions in the area affiliated, we could probably have something on the order of maybe five to 8,000 members uh, so, uh, affiliated with our labor council. And so hearing, and, and that's not that much smaller than, than where y'all are at. Is that right? How, how, many, how many members do your affiliated unions have? So we have about 20,000 AFL-CIO unions in Vermont, and we have been growing. When we started, it was around 10,000. Like you said, VSEA joined us recently, and even more recently, um, the University of Vermont uh, support staff at the Medical Center have joined, and there are 2,200 workers there. 
Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's all. That's all really exciting. And, and so then, Ellen, you said that you are a uh, uh, you're relatively new to you know the the slate and, and leadership. How how close? How involved have you been in the labor federation generally? Were were you a, were you you know a, a delegate from your union? What what union are you a part of? Were you a delegate uh, uh, from your union during these last several years? Or um, you know how, how did you come into this? And 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 what motivated you to 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 be a part of this slate? Well, I um, I was the recipient of how amazing our Vermont State Labor Council is. That was my uh, my entry to understanding what the Labor Council is and what it does. I was part of the founding group of UVM, University of Vermont, um, Staff United. So mm -hmm. that's represent, represent 1,400 clerical, technical, specialized, and professional staff at the University of Vermont who had never been unionized before. It was a third attempt. And it was the winning attempt. Um, in 2021, we voted in our union. In 2022, we won our contract. Um, the State Labor Council showed up for us. There was all kinds of support. There were trainings that they offered to anybody in any unions or not in unions, the organized and the un unorganized. So, um, so I had been, you know, I'd had my hands full with my own union. I'm the co-president of that union. And it has been nonstop in addition to my, my full-time job. So I'm rank and file. Mm -hmm. um, so I hadn't been very involved with the State Labor Council except to you know, be on the receiving end of amazing support that they do all over the state. So when I was asked to stand for office, um, I enthusiastically said yes, um, because I want to see that, the direction that Liz talked about, I want to see that continue. I don't want to see us slide back into sort of business union, business use as usual, um, endorsing candidates, hanging out in the state house, um, people in suits, talking to other people in suits. So I want to help organize from the bottom up, which is the model that my union uses um, and aspires to use to. We never do it perfectly, but we definitely aspire to do it, and we're, we're having some great success. So this is why I agreed to stand for office, not because I needed more work to do, because um, I don't. <laughs> so, and the other, you know, the other amazing thing to me was that when the the previous president decided to step aside, um, what is replacing that is a all three women leadership team. So this this election felt really significant to me that we would be the mm. first all women leadership team in the in the Vermont State Labor Council's history um, because I've yeah I think the the labor movement needs different kinds of leadership now and um, so it's very exciting to me hey five seconds just wanted to say that this is only possible because of our donors if you want to see more of this then consider donating yourself at tvlr.fm slash donate so Liz, something that you you know you you've been in probably you know way more union meetings than I have, and I've been in a lot of union meetings, right, <laughs> and uh, a lot of uh, informal meetings with union folks, and uh, in a very common refrain, especially from you know old heads, uh, folks who have have been in the movement for a long time and have really you know, dedicated their life to it and, and have, uh, you know, tried to do everything that they can or everything that they know to do. Um, and and so, uh, you'll, you'll hear a complaint that, you know, people just don't care. Right. People don't care. Uh, people won't come to meetings. Um, you know, you can't you can't motivate people, uh, young people. They, they don't want to do any. You know, they, they just want the, the all the benefits of the union handed to them and they're not willing to fight for it. And, uh, you know, people, you know, folks who have kind of been in that rut, they get really disillusioned with the idea that things could be better, that you could see a union uh, or a labor federation where members are participating and excited and uh, debating things about the future and having a having plans, you know, a, a 10 point plan or, or a five year plan or a 10 year plan. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day about, uh, you know, planning for the future and, and a, you know, a multi year plan. And they were like, you know, brother, I'm just planning. I, I'm just trying to get to the next month. That's all I can think about. I don't have time for that. And, you know, there's 
a lot of there's a lot of that and not without reason right they're not without reason and so how do you talk to folks uh as a representative of the labor council up in vermont um you know how do you convince them that things that things can be better when you're trying to get them to participate in in the in the labor council and in their union Um, I'll go ahead and try to take a yeah. shot at this. And Ellen, I, I know you have a lot of words of wisdom to share on this as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's a huge challenge and it, it takes a lot of work to, to get people to participate. I don't want to sugarcoat anything, but I think why a lot of folks disengage is because there isn't actually space for them to think and be creative and imaginative. Mm. Uh, mm. You know, there are the, a lot of union meetings. Um, I've been to a fair number, uh, no, probably no, no contest. I'm sure you've been to just as many, but you know, uh, there's a number of them that can feel very dry and stilted and uh, all, you know, really overladen with parliamentary procedure. It feels very inaccessible to participate. Um, there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of room for imagining or, or having a more open discussion. And I find that is probably, you know, personally in my own experience, I find that to be very frustrating to deal with, especially for those who want to think about the future and big picture um, and young folks who, you know, are just getting started and have lots of questions and also incredible vision and energy right now are leading this movement. And I think, you know, by having spaces where the, things are a little bit more open, it's a little bit easier to get folks to participate. And I, you know, that's the basic structure of a worker circle. We don't have an agenda. We don't have minutes to approve or reports or things like that. That's important in running certain organizations. I'm not trying to um, diminish them, but I think there needs to be spaces where we can just have open conversations about what is union democracy? What is a union? Uh, what does it mean um, to be, uh, you know, work as a together as a working class? Um, you know, how is uh, society structured? Who makes decisions? Um, what's going on in your workplace and how can we come up with creative solutions to figure it out? How can we all work together as a, as a united working class here in Vermont? And I think that, having those spaces makes it all the more easy to participate and also just having conversations with people and getting to know them and building relationships. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, folks that I've worked with or, you know, and others who have worked, uh, worked with or friends with, and you just, you know, bring a couple more friends and it just, <laughs> the chain keeps going on. And, you know, I think one of the most important things in those conversations too, is like really shifting the notion of what it, means to be in a union. Um, so there's a really, uh, the kind of, as Ellen said, business union mentality of thinking about a union where the workers are kind of passive, they're dues paying members, and everything is controlled by maybe a few officers and staff. And that's not really what a union is. A union is the, the group of workers coming together to change the balance of power in the workplace. And I'm borrowing that definition from uh, one of the workers, uh, Dan, a grad worker at UVM, who has been coming to our worker circles and, and shared that beautiful definition with all of us. And so just really shifting that mindset to, to everyone thinking that they are really an active part of this and need to participate and their contributions are valuable. Yeah, I'd like to jump in too. Um, first to talk about the, the idea that young people might not see themselves as getting involved. Um, I, I heard a statistic recently that there's a poll out that 80% of young people support unions, mm. right? They know what's what, they know the economy that's being handed to them. Um, and with the exception of the children of the 1%, people see it. Um, and it, an amazing example of that in my own union was uh, that we had a struggle going on and we decided to have a presence at the convocation of all of the freshmen, some big ritual that they do the university um, for freshmen. So there were 300 fresh, 3000 freshmen there. And we were very nervous. We thought we would get a lot of pushback from them. Like you're spoiling our special day or something or not understanding. Mm. 
we didn't have to explain much of anything to them. They took one look at our signs and gave us thumbs up and gave us shouts of approval and said, go union and said, yes, staff needs to be treated right. How can we help? How can we follow along? How can we be kept in the loop? We were stunned. So I wow. think I think this is right. You create the space. Um, worker circles are amazing at that. We've had a couple of younger people from small places who want to organize coming in and hearing from people like me who are somewhat new, but our union is really vibrant. And then people in more established unions and all of that um, really like is uh, helps helps people like Liz said, reflect. We never get time to mm. do that. The other thing I'll say is that engaging members and, and Liz touched on this too. Um, in my union, it's all about engaging our members. It's, it's your union. It's our union. You know, um, I'm just there because somebody thought I should have a lot of responsibility in this union. Mm -hmm. I'm not special. And I took it on with my co-president, who is also amazing. Um, but but we see engagement like every our our bargaining sessions are open to our members. We have big screens on the wall with 150 or 300 or 500 of our members watching holding management accountable. Those people are also getting to see what it looks like for their representatives on the bargaining team, which is all of us, we don't use lawyers, standing up to the boss and they get excited and they feel like they're part of something. And we're creating a place on our campus, figurative mostly, a place um, that the boss will never create for us. And it's community, it's relationships, right? And so out of that engagement comes the ability to mobilize people. And out of mobilizing means that we are doing something together, actually doing something together, which brings people together more than anything else. And then we win at the table even more. Even mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, you know, you can't have action without engagement. Um, and you got to build it from the bottom up. And so, you know, back to our state labor council, this is what it is trying to foster in the state of Vermont, which I think is so very valuable. And we did have a contested election at the last election um, with the, the folks contesting our slate, really wanting to move back into a more traditional lobbying role mm. for the AF for the AFL-CIO in Vermont, and we won. So that is a good sign. Um, and we're trying to keep keep that agenda going at this point. Well, on the, you know, the, the the question of lobbying and politics, you know, Liz, you mentioned that you're uh, specifically there is a, there, there's you know, mention in your plan or a commitment to have less dependence on the two major parties. Uh, I know that y'all, I, I believe, recently passed a resolution to strengthen your ties with the Vermont Progressive Party. Can, can you talk to us about your political program and, um, you, you know, the successes or uh, your building for success that, that you've seen over the last few years? Yeah, so... We think that the, the solution is, is organizing and engagement, as Alan said, to shifting things politically as well. And instead of just you know putting our endorsement next to everyone with a D, we, we try to actually look at who's really pushing and advocating for our issues and priorities. And we've tried to form campaigns that um, are more issue-based versus like putting a lot of energy into electoral work. So um, we mainly try to work on things that are going to increase the power of the working class. And so our, our main priority right now is getting our own version of what we are calling the Vermont Protect the Right to Organize Act. Um, it would ban captive audience meetings, give farm and domestic workers the right to organize, and simplify union elections in the public sector through what are sometimes known as card check or majority sign up elections. And instead of you know trying to win that by you know having donated to the right people or um, hiring a lobbyist and you know paying thousands and mm. thousands for that, we talk about this program, this bill, and everything through um, all of our other organizing work, through through worker circles, by getting people engaged, by going to union meetings and talking to members directly about this. And 
and actually engaging in discussion like what why is it important for um, union members to help non-union workers form unions like what does that uh, give us all as workers and obviously it leads to a conversation about where our power as workers actually is which is in our strength and numbers and our ability to act together in solidarity and that is i think a really important shift in versus thinking about power as something that's outside ourselves that we um you know give to politicians or lobbyists and uh, through money and just hope for the best working people are never going to be able to compete on that terrain we don't have that money we don't have the wealth and resources that's not where our power comes from and so our political program is based on organizing an understanding of power that is different than I think uh, a, a little out of other um, perhaps labor councils have. And I think it has had pretty good success because honestly, politicians really do want to at least uh, hear from their constituents or feel pressured from their constituents if they do. Mm. And it has uh, more of an effect than I think, um, you know, donations or endorsements have in the past. Uh, we have got the PRO Act out of the um, Senate 23 to seven, and hopefully it's gonna be uh, passed out of the house this year. But we also, you know, don't put all our hopes in, in the state house as well. We, we try to keep building our base because that's what we need to continue to do, especially after decades of not doing that as, a, as an entire, um, union or a working class movement here in Vermont. That's awesome. That that's really 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 cool. Um, love to would love to see something like that in, in Alabama. Um, it, it the the stuff that we're seeing out of our state house is, is just absolutely absolutely horrible. Um, so uh, love hearing some positive stuff out of uh, folks on on the other side of the country. Um, Adam, do you have any other questions for uh, uh, for for Liz and Ellen? Honestly, the, the only other thing I could think of would just be what suggestions do you have or advice or guidance, any feedback you have for folks like us who are labor activists in other states who, you know, would love to see a more robust movement uh, and specifically a, a state federation that's more robust and, and stronger and more engaging. Uh, yeah, just I'm curious to hear from both of y'all anything y'all would pass along to folks like us. Ellen, we can start with you. Yeah, didn't know who was going to go there. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's organizing 101 in my mind. It's it's forming relationships, having one-on-one -on -one conversations in your unions, between your state labor council and folks in your unions. Um, there's nothing that replaces that. There are no shortcuts around it. Um, so, you know, and... And if you're in a labor council, how can you support those locals? How can you show up for them on picket lines um, through broadcasting what's going on with them in their in their struggles for contracts or whatever they're trying to do or forming unions? Um, be there for those locals and, ha and and engage people so they feel connected to your to your labor council. Um, so that, you know, there's so many people who don't understand what the AFL-CIO is. You say, and I'm an AFT, which is a very similar sounding <laughs> set of initials. And there are people in my union still who, when you say AFL-CIO, think you're talking about the AFT mm. or vice versa. So we, you know, I think we have to help people understand what a council of unions is, what it can do and how it can be there for the locals and the people trying to organize on the ground. All right, Liz, any thoughts? I think Ellen said it best. Um, just trying to build the, those networks and uh, as much as possible and building infrastructure to do so, you know, whether that's like, you know, getting some special texting platform or, you know, making sure you have lists and everyone's reaching out to each other, just like you would in an organizing campaign. Um, you know, calling each other, checking in on each other, um, you know, and, and not just for, you know, when when crises is emerged, also just to mm -hmm. help each other um, outside of the workplace. You know, when we had flooding here in Vermont, we made sure we showed up in communities that were affected 
and uh, provided mutual aid. And we were very grateful for the AFL-CIO giving us money through the Community Union Fund to do so. It's really important to show up in communities like that because sometimes uh, people don't see unions um, as caring about the working class more broadly. And that's, you know, further couldn't be further from the truth. And we need to make sure that we're, we're connecting with all workers and, and building a real movement. And, you know, having fun together, too. Um, that's something we definitely need to do more of here. Uh, but, I, you know, we, we try to uh, put together some social events and we're trying to put together some more and uh, just to build those foundations and relationships. Um, and just, yeah, having having space to imagine a future as well. I think that's mm. super important, making sure you create spaces for that and bringing food to those spaces definitely helps. <laughs> yeah. Food always helps. Yeah. Yes. I, I really have learned a lot and uh, have enjoyed talking to y'all and just hearing about your success. And uh, I think, you know, whether it's the work you're doing in Vermont or the work that we're seeing with UAW and its militant leadership, I think there's just so much potential the more folks get involved in this labor movement to, to revitalize it and to build the movement that we need and deserve uh, because we've been getting our butts kicked for way too long and, and we we need to fight back. And I really am proud to see what y'all are doing. Uh, and Jacob and I will probably be calling on y'all quite a bit for suggestions and advice and uh, ideas uh, as we try to replicate some of that success here in North Alabama. Yep. Really appreciate y'all's time. Thanks for coming on. Thank, Thank you so much. We wish and you luck in so yeah. Alabama. Go ahead, Liz. What? Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was just saying your show is, is doing so much for the movement, too, so I really appreciate you all doing this. All right. Liz Medina, Executive Director for the Vermont AFL-CIO. Ellen Kay, Executive Vice President. Uh, appreciate y'all taking the time. Uh, really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Uh, definitely, like Adam said, we're going to be giving them a call at some point. Uh, no doubt, as we, uh, as we work to... Uh, build up the labor council here in North Alabama. We're doing, we're, we're, you know, we're we're making some strides. We've made some strides here in the last year or so. We're uh, we're we're getting some things done, uh, but much much more to do. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, appreciate those sisters very much. And uh, yeah. yeah, keep your eyes on Vermont. Uh, lots of exciting things happening out of there, and um, I think that's just really cool to see um, <clears throat> to see a state kind of. I don't know. You've seen a lot of labor councils that are revitalized, but to see a state federation, mm -hmm. uh, to see it at that level is, is yep. really impressive. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm going to keep my eyes on it and I need to find a good reason to go to Vermont. Yep. So um, mm -hmm. anyone listening who has something cool happening in Vermont and you need and the uh, budget to send you <laughs> and you need the Valley Labor Report there. Um, I, I'd love yeah. to go. Uh, yes. So. You just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm. 